as you know, we've had quite a bit of things going on on YouTube and all. And uh, I got two letters. I thought I would just share them with you right quick. Because there's, there's a lot of people out there that are hurting as far as the clear gospel message. You see, when you don't know and don't really believe that it's salvation is really free, you're going to have problems. You're going to have questions and doubts. These people who look at their life to try to prove that they're saved, if you use your life as evidence that you're saved, you have to come away with only one conclusion. You're not. Because if you have to stop your sinning, turn from your sins to be saved, you're either got to be saved regardless of how many sins you commit after you're saved, or you can't commit any sins, and so you're only saved until you commit the next sin. It's got to be one way or the other. There is no in-between. And so that causes a lot of questions and doubts. Because then who is the one that determines whether you're really saved? You? Well, you've got to do these good works, okay? Who determines how good they are? How do you judge that your works are better than somebody else's? Because they have to be better than somebody else's. Because the lost man can go to church just like a Christian can. So if that proves you're saved, that should prove the lost man's saved too. Because you use the same evidence. Do y'all understand what I'm saying when I say this? Are you really right there? Are you following me? Anyway, this one here is from a guy. I won't tell you his name because you don't need to know. He says, hi, Dr. Arnold. I recently came across some of your videos online, and am I glad I did. I appreciate your simple explanation of what the gospel is. I'm blown away by how many preachers out there preach this lordship salvation. Lordship salvation is simply a term that's used for people who say you've got to make Christ the Lord and the master of your life, meaning you've got to serve the Lord. You've got to persevere in the faith. And if you don't allow him to be Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And if he's not Lord of all, you're not saved at all. Doesn't that make sense? So after listening to some of your videos, that message that they preach does not make any sense. Its focus is on what you do and how you perform, not on what Christ has done. Total heresy. I can see how these pastors are all fruit inspectors like you call them. In the past few months, I've started going to a different church. I like what I've seen and heard so far. There is concern, question, I have though after this weekend. I heard the pastor quote Galatians 5.21. And he says that if you continue in sins, like immorality, that you are not saved. Do you think this man is preaching lordship? What would you think? If you continue in sins, like immorality, that you are not saved. So how you determine whether you're saved or not? By how you're living. If you're not living it, that's a sign you're not saved. And that's what preachers, preachers are preaching this all over the world. And there's not that many churches like our church that preaches it clearly. But you take some churches, they can have mega churches and 10, 15,000 people attend them as long as the preacher doesn't talk about sin. They got to make it feel good and feel happy. You know, la, 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 you do anything you want to do, it doesn't matter. In the past few months, I said I started going to a different church. He says, um, do you think this man is preaching lordship? I've heard him say many times that it is by grace alone, so I started to hear this. I was startled to hear this. When I see those verses like Galatians 5.21, I have understood it that in Christ, God does not view us through those sins anymore. We are perfectly holy in his eyes. Is it dangerous when preachers use these verses and say people who are committing these sins are not saved? Thanks, a guy named Matt. The problem is when they read that these they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But when you do those things, that's the sign of the flesh. The flesh shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And so a Christian has how many natures? Two, so he can walk in the flesh and in the spirit. And a Christian can still commit the sins of the flesh, but God sees his child in the spirit, the new birth. And so, but preachers don't understand that. So they have a problem. This is one that says, your latest video, Jesus versus John MacArthur, shows up as a suggested video. I don't know, like that one we saw today. I don't know if that's 
same. But he says, I wish I could express how glad I am to see it. I lived most of my life as a carnal Christian. I was Christian as a baby, accepted the free gift of God at four years old, sprinkled into the church, baptized by submersion ten times, once for each time I was saved. I was simultaneously raised under churches teaching Calvinism, a holiness, and free will, with none of them laid out the whole picture. As an adult, I started a study to determine what the Bible really teaches and spent 20 years picking bits and pieces of Calvinism out of my faith. Until then, I was never been able to write a statement of faith. Why? Because it was too confusing. I have thousands of digital resources in my library and just about as many dollars. So I can dig to the depths in the original language and see what the background and core meaning of the words are. Then I decided to start a website to share Bible teaching. God kept repeating to me, beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. God doesn't use all of our words to me, but instead loads my head with verses I memorized or recently read and I just recognized the message. It took a few days, but I realized my message was that the scripture was written for the common man. The same day I found the verses, Romans 10, 6 through 10, referring back to Deuteronomy 30. He says, God's command is easy to understand. You don't need a theologian to interpret what is happening in heaven. You don't need someone to dig to the depths of the original language to explain God's simple plan of salvation, which we teach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But with a heart man believe in the righteousness, and with a mouth confession confirms your salvation. <laughs> you still got a little bit in there, don't you? I had originally set up my site by taking over a friend's site who quit because of health. But the answer to what do I post keeps coming back. What every ministry posts. Things to edify those who have been through what you went through. So I found the verse most fitting and bought the, the domain, domain name, save so as by fire, <laughs> dot com. And I'm in the process of changing the focus of the site with academic type teaching to helping carnal Christians learn the milk of the word and to grow to mature Christians, which they can start consuming the meat of the word. It will mean starting the site over from scratch. So he's got a, a, a long way to go, got some things to do. So he says, as I'm taking this mission one day at a time, I have so many things I want to share. I really don't know where to begin. Please pray for me. And if you can find a prayer warrior or a team who will pray for me daily, I would really appreciate it. If there's anything you would like to suggest or offer the help, I appreciate it. This isn't a solicitation. I am sure you're very busy with your own ministry. But sometimes it only takes a few words. Well, I do need the prayer. Right now it's on my mind that I may embed one or more of your videos and articles on the site as time goes on. It's not often I find someone who uses the Bible text as their tool and they aren't Church of Christ. Thank you, my brother. Uh, when he's talking about embed, embed, one or more of your videos in his site, is that a good thing, bad thing? Yep, that's good. good thing. All right. And I can tell you, if you um, read any of the comments that are on this last sermon that we did on Jesus versus Calvinism, no, uh, Jesus versus John MacArthur, uh, you'll find there's over 700 comments that have been made. 700, that is incredible. So anyway, it's... Um, going to be interesting. I think that uh, Louis is doing a pretty good job working in that phase of the ministry. and So I'm glad that he came along at the right time and is willing to do that. I don't know why. Just can't just do everything. You know. Just. Now I find out that uh, Kyla, his wife, is uh, smarter than him. I didn't know that either. So you must, you must have taught her. All right, you got your note there. It's not a, a big fancy note. It's just uh, something simple that I wanted to explain to you tonight. And always remember the, the goal. The reason God left us in this world is not so we can just sit around and have good Christian fellowship. And we do. And not just to have third Sunday dinners, which we do. Uh, not just to sing, though we like to sing. And, um, you know, come to church and sit comfortably because... Everything on TV was boring tonight. So there is 
something that we need to be thinking about always on our mind and praying for. But then the verse here, John 15, 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. Now, he didn't say, I chose to save you over somebody else. Because God does not override somebody's will. He doesn't force somebody to believe. And he can choose people for service. And there's times when God has used lost people for service. But you can be a disciple, a follower, a learner of Christ, and never trust him as Savior. But what he did tell his disciples, he says that you should go and bring forth fruit. So it's not so much as the fruit of the Holy Spirit that lives within you, because you don't have to go anywhere to do that. When you have to go and bring forth fruit, that means that something's out there and you're going to get it. So I believe that's more of a reference for soul winning. And when he says in verse 8, uh, Herein is my Father glorified that you what? Bear, bear what? Much fruit. So God wants us to bear fruit. Now, the key to fulfilling this goal is uh, laid out very simple right here. First is your faith in Christ. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, you were born into God's family. And as a child of God, it says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So you received him by faith. You're to live by faith, walk by faith, and taking God at his word. So the next word here is fellowship. Fellowship with Christ. So it's one thing to know him as your Savior. You're going to heaven when you die. But fellowship with the Lord is, um, is how can we walk together unless we be agreed. It's not that God's you had to twist and bend his ear and, and make him go your way. It's you going his way. You walking with him. Now he said he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. And so we're thankful for that. That's a great thing to know. But I want you to take very quickly and just look there in the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John and chapter 1. This is to the child of God, to the Christian. And like the apostles that were here at the time of Christ, they actually walked with him. They saw him. They talked to him. They touched him. They handled him, as they said. And you'll see what he says here in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. They saw the Lord. They were eyewitnesses. They actually walked and talked with him. Now, you and I, we would love to be able to do that. But it'd be a shame if you turn out to be a Judas. So I'll just take it the way it is. He says in verse 2, For the life was manifest. This eternal life was revealed in a person. For we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That's why in the last chapter of the book of 1 John, in chapter 5, where he says that this is the true God and eternal life. Jesus Christ is eternal life. So that when you have Christ, you have eternal life. He says, he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son, God hath not life. So if you accepted Christ as your Savior, you have just accepted eternal life. And that's why people who believe that you have to do good works to keep eternal life, like Jesus said, I'll never leave you and never forsake you. What do you think that means? It means you can never lose eternal life. I always see eternal security everywhere. I don't know. I guess I can find it in Genesis 1.1. But anyway, he talks about the fellowship that we enjoy. Then he makes a statement in verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. Now remember this. When you were born in the world... Flesh birth walks in darkness. You trusted Christ as Savior, got a new birth, walks in the light. So 1 John really helps a child of God to discern whether or not is he walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. Because if you understand the works of the flesh and you bring forth the works of the flesh, guess what? You're walking in darkness. But you can say anything 
So chapter 2 says over and over again, uh, thou sayest, y'all say it. You can say anything, but that doesn't mean that it's true. So he deals with this issue. But notice what he says here in verse 7. But if we walk in the light, so walking in the darkness or walking in the light is an option every child of God has. It didn't say you can't walk in the darkness because you can. And if you walk in the darkness, you're going to walk in the flesh. And if you walk in the flesh, you're going to bring forth the works of the flesh. That's why in chapter 2, he talks about the love of the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, all those flesh things, the things of the world. And so he says here, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So after you trust Christ as Savior, the Bible does want us as his children to walk with the Lord. And nobody can walk, make you walk with the Lord. They can't make you close to the Lord. Only you can do that. You can, you can go to the right places, do the right things, and things like that. But nobody can make your heart right between you and God. That's the decision that you have to make. Now, the next statement I hear is faithfulness to Christ. That means to do the thing God wants you to do. So if I'm going to walk with the Lord and he tells me what he wants me to do, what he wants to accomplish through my life, well, that requires faithfulness on my part. This is what James' chapter 2, uh, well, the whole book is talking about. Be ye not hearers only, but doers of the work. And whoever will do that, God says, shall be blessed in his deeds, blessed in his works. And so we are to do the work of the Lord. So you and I can do the work of God. Now, number four, if we do the work of God the way God wants us to do the work, we are striving toward one thing, and that's for fruit. We should try to be leading people to Christ or challenging people who know the Lord how to serve the Lord, how to teach people how to be a soul winner. And uh, I had this morning, I had uh, Greg Steer call me this morning, 7 o'clock his time. And uh, just want to know, how, how are you doing? I says, I'm doing fine. <laughs> and I told him about my brother and how my brother is doing. And he told me he had just finished some, uh, uh, a lead to cost thing that he was doing. And uh, he said he had to run 5,000 or something like that on one thing. And uh, he says he got another thing coming up in October. But he says, I just wanted to call you up and tell you, I am so thankful you mentored me, that you taught me what to do years and years ago. And uh, he don't have to do that. I told him, I said, well, you don't have to call me up and thank me. I, I know you are just by what you're doing. I appreciate that. But um, anyway, the statement here, number four, fruitfulness for Christ, sowing with expectations of reaping. I like to sow seeds. You know, leave a track here, leave a track there. But there's other ways that God uses the word fruit. And I want to show you that in just a minute. But look at the next statement. If there is something wrong with your fruitfulness, there could be something wrong with your faithfulness. Would you think that? Maybe, possible. Christ says, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. So if you're following, you should be fishing for... See, there are people who love to fish. Well, they love the tackle. They love the fishing rod. And they can tell you everything about a fishing rod. And they got all kind of baits and tackle. And they know how to do everything that comes to it. They can describe all kinds of fish and all that. But there's one thing that they don't do sometimes. Fish. Are you a fisherman if you don't fish? Are you a fisherman if you never catch fish? What do you think? If you go fishing and you never catch a fish, are you a fisherman? I'm, I'm, I'm just asking. I never thought that deep about it. So, are you a soul winner if you never want a soul? What about a seed sower? You can sow seed. But we don't always know who we've led to the Lord because some people may trust the Lord years after you've talked to them. He said, well, I've never let a soul to the Lord. You don't really know. Have you sown the seed? Just keep sowing seeds. And trust that God's seed will grow in somebody's mind. Remember the seed, the sower who went forth and he sowed? That's what we do. Now, there's two scriptures that I put down here. One that I usually use whenever I'm going to tell the Jim Tenjan story, Luke chapter 13. And I think it would be good just to take a quick look at that. In the book of Luke chapter 13, 
Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. And you'll notice in verse 6, down in verse 6, this is on page 1094. He says, He spake also this parable. Certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and he sought fruit thereon. Now why would he look for fruit? Well, you've got a fig tree. What would you think he wants off that fig tree? Figs. He wants some figs off of the fig tree. And did he find any? He didn't find any. So he says, he found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? He answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, fertilize it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Now, generally sometimes the fig tree can refer to Israel. And he had been there about three years. And Israel is not bringing forth the fruits of righteousness, which God is looking for. And he may leave it there a little bit longer, but they wound up rejecting the man that was in charge. And Israel was destroyed. There may be a, a story there. But the key thing is, is you're looking for fruit on the tree. Even when Christ came, he was looking for fruit on the tree. The fruits of righteousness. And he didn't find any. He says, every tree that bringeth not forth the fruits of righteousness, he says, is going to cut down. And remember, every tree that grows, we're all bad trees. So that's why all bad, all die. Everybody sins, everybody dies. The only one that was born into this world that was a good tree was that little tender plant that was well described there in the book of Isaiah in chapter 53 and he was a green tree and he says if they'll cut down a green tree what will they do to the dry that's another story but anyway uh, if you look there very quickly and well we don't need to look at it we're not going to have that much time but look back here at your notes now you can read John 15 also along with this and uh because we're supposed to be, we're, we're in the vine. And so we're supposed to bring forth fruit, what God wants. Now look at the statement. The problem, there's a problem. There's always a problem. Number five is don't just hear a message, be a message. In other words, in the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, when it talks about uh, being of faith, the just shall live by faith. Well, there's a verse right in there that talks about if you're going to run, make it clean, clear, make it plain. And a lot of people are running, missionaries around the world, and they, have, they don't have the message right. They're running to tell a false message that doesn't save. And yet, even in the 23rd chapter of uh, Matthew, Jesus nailed the Pharisees. He says, you'll cross land and ocean and waters and so forth to make a proselyte, to get one person to believe like you believe, and to make him a twofold child of hell. Now, look at number six. When we talk about being a message, in other words, God uses not just the message. He uses the messenger. Now, I've said this before, but let me just mention it to you again. I know it's been a while, but I was about 1966 I was in ranch it was in the summertime Dr. Stanford who was director of the ranch and president of the college he, he went off to speak someplace so he had Mel's speak in ranch so while Mel's was speaking in ranch that night I was standing over to the side and Mel's wanted me to tell him what kind of a job he did Mel's poured out his heart, did a great job. Man, he held the right verses, told a few jokes, gave the invitation. Not a soul raised their hand to trust the Lord. He came up to me. He was so dejected. He came up to me and said, what the hell wrong? I said, Mel, you didn't do anything wrong. He says, nobody, nobody trusts the Lord. I said, well, you, you did the best you can, Mel. That's all you can do. Well, Ray was going to be out again the next week, and so Mel's got a chance to speak again. This time he was better prepared. And so he got up there and he told a few more jokes. 
gospel clear verses, simple, clear, gave the invitation, and not a soul trusts the Lord. After the thing was over, he came up and he had tears in his eyes. He was crying. He could not believe it. And the reason was because Ray always had people trust the Lord Ranch. Mel did not have any. He was so down and discouraged. And I didn't know what to tell him because I didn't see anything he did wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. Ray came back, and the next Thursday night he was in ranch, and he was telling about some war stories and him, you know, drinking beer enough to sink the city, and I was going down and landed in France and blah, 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 blah. Just told a bunch of stories. Then right then, uh, uh, pulled out his wallet and says, uh, and he walked through, went through the wallet and he quoted John 3, 16, and had everybody bow their head. About 15 people trust the Lord. This really blew Mel's mind. God not only uses the message, he uses a man. And somebody else sometimes can say the same thing and they can't get through for some reason. Now, I don't know what it is. I can't explain it. Hank Linson, I mean, Hank Linson was kind of like that. If you had somebody that was lost, man, you'd want somebody like Hank Linson to talk to them or Ray Stanford because they could talk them into trust the Lord. Somehow it was the way, the way they did it or the Holy Spirit had freedom in I don't know what it is, but God uses the man, and he uses the message. And then there is to be a motive, and the means, and the method. I used to have a sermon on all ends. You know, I used to like to outline sermons. But it's God uses you. And for some reason or other, you've got to make sure that you're right between you and you. Somehow or other, it's, you can do it in a professional way. You can't. You get it out, but you didn't get it across. And there's sometimes that's about the way we do it. We, we witness. We got it out, but we don't know how to draw that net for some reason. Some little thing that we say or do that do, well, it doesn't. They can't quite get it. And I've had people that will try their best to lead somebody to the Lord. I had Jenna come up to me one night. She says, "Yankee, Yankee." He said, "You, you got to talk to this person." This person is so hard, they're so cold, I can't get through the to them. I've given them everything. I gave them the wallet illustration. I explained everything to them. Yankee, there's, I don't think, know if anybody can get through to them. Would you just talk to them? I said, oh, yeah, I'll try. They come up to me. I says, hey, how you doing? I says, where are you going to go when you die? Well, I'm not sure. I said, you're not sure. I said, you know, if um, I offered you my watch and you accept, you'd have a watch. And if you offered my, I'll offer you my shirt and you accept, you'd have a shirt. If Christ walked in here and offered you eternal life, what would you have? She says, eternal life. I said, if it's eternal life and all your pain, sins are paid, where would you go to that? She said, I'd go to heaven. Trust the Lord just like that. I said the same thing in about a minute. She could not get through to that person. And sometimes I find myself being in Jana's place and I couldn't get through. And there's people that I just seem, I just can't listening to me. Look at the next statement. We suffer today from these two two main things, and this is why it's very important. A church, or Christ without a church. You see, there's people who say they love Christ, but they don't love the church. What is the church made of? What is the church? It's the wall, ceiling, the floor, the pews. Is that the church? Church is people. Oh, I just love God. It's people I can't stand. He says, how can you say you love me that you can't see when you don't love people that you can't see? So there's people who say they love the Lord. I love Christ, but I just don't like, and they'll never go to church. They don't care. I don't need to go to church. That's one thing if there is not a church, and you don't have the means to do so. But if there is, and you can, and you just won't, well, I'm so spiritually minded, I can see all the trash over there at that church. And I'm so holy, I don't want to get myself dirty. And so I'm more spiritual than if I just go ahead and stay home, than if I went to that church to get contaminated by those sinners over there, those hypocrites. Now, the other way is looking at this. There's people who love the church, but they don't love Christ. Is that possible? People can love the church, you know, the atmosphere, whatever it is, and then don't love God. So... Wouldn't it be great if everything worked together? Look at the next statement I wrote down here. I don't have much sympathy for any man or movement who wants to divorce the bridegroom from the bride. 
You see, the bridegroom, Christ, he loves the bride. And if I love him, I should love those whom he loves. Don't that make sense? All right. I knew you'd like that. I knew that. Now, there's a solution to the way we live because of the way we think. Now, I want you to take your Bible and look in Romans chapter 5. The book of Romans chapter 5. See, once you and I trust Christ as our Savior, we have eternal life. And the Bible from chapter 4 of the book of Romans tells us that when we believe on Christ, we have his righteousness imputed unto us. That's found there in verse 23 and 24 of the previous chapter. So now in chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, Therefore being justified by your works, what does it say? Justified by what? Faith. We have peace with God. Now, there's a difference between having peace with God and having the peace of God. Peace with God means here's God and here's me and my sins separates me from God and we are enemies. So Christ came into the world to take away the enmity, that payment for our sins, so that if I accept that payment, we can have peace with God, and God is not going to pour his wrath out on me. So I have been justified just as if I had never sinned. Nothing separating us. So he says here in verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We stand in God's grace because of the payment Jesus Christ made on the cross for us. And the next part of that verse, and rejoice in this joyful anticipation of the glory of God. The glory of God, all have sinned and come short of the what? Glory of God, the perfection of God. Here, when he says, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In other words, I can be made perfect in God's eyes. I can be justified, as righteous as God, and God sees no wrong, no fault in me. Now, that's done by grace because we stand in grace, not by our works. That was fully dealt with in chapter 4. So now notice what he says in verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience, experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now, there's an interesting portion of this scripture that I want to focus on. If you'll look there in your notes, I uh, kind of brought that out. The very verse, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Hope maketh not ashamed. In other words, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you trust him as your Savior, the Bible talks about and uses a couple of words like you'll never be confused. You'll never be ashamed that you trusted Christ as your Savior because you realize what you got by trusting Christ as your Savior that you would have never had if you tried to earn it. You can't be saved. You can never have any hope whatsoever. But it says, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Now get this. What we have received, this salvation, we have received it. Now, there's some things that the Holy Spirit that indwells each and every one of us wants to share with other people. So how does the Holy Spirit share things of God to other people? And it gives it away right here. Those two words that I put in bold, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit lives within us to shed abroad the fruits of the Spirit. Now, that's a different kind of fruit. The other one we're talking about that hangs on the tree, we're to get fruit from the people we lead to the Lord. But I wanted to see this a little bit differently. Now, in Galatians 5.22, a verse that we put right here in the notes, says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, we know that we spoke uh, just Sunday about the um, idea on, on prayer a little bit and that we should focus, first of all, upon the spiritual aspect of it, how that whatever happens in this world, regardless of the trials and afflictions, whatever they may be, I want God to give me the strength and the grace to go through it. I don't want to damage my testimony or his. So I want him to give me anything that I need to deal whatever might come up. Now, let's just take, for example, there in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, remember, it doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit lives within you, all of the fruits are available to you. It means that if the Holy Spirit can control you, he can love through you. He can shed abroad his love through your love to individuals. One of the greatest ways of doing that for the lost man is to tell him about the love of Christ. Now, what about, is there anything else that you could say that God wants me to demonstrate to other people? So I'm supposed to love others, not just in the gospel sense, getting people to trust the Lord. But I'm supposed to love other people. Now, let me ask you a difficult question. In spite of their political positions, do you love Nancy Pelosi? Don't answer. I'm just, just a question. Do, do, you, do you love Donald Trump? Do you love the man that just slaughtered a bunch of people? In El Paso and Ohio, those people that did all those wicked things, but do you love them? If you love them, what would you want more than anything else to happen to those individuals? What would you want? You want them to trust the Lord. No Christian, no believer should ever want a lost person to go to hell. Because the love of God that shed abroad in our heart would help us to love those people. And it doesn't matter who they are and what they've done. You see, God doesn't stop loving us because of how wicked we may choose to live. So we should not hate them just because of the way they live. People that are homosexuals, should we love them? What about a woman who had an abortion? We love them. Somebody commits murder. Somebody robs the bank. You see, it's not the sin that determines whether we love or not love. But we're supposed to demonstrate that we really love. I'm not against the law doing what the law should do. I'm talking about their soul. Now, do you think there's anybody in this world that needs to know God loves them? What about those who've already trusted Christ as Savior? Do they need to be reminded of that? Is it easy for us to get sidetracked and question and doubt whether or not God loves us? And isn't it good when somebody encourages us? And sometimes that might be the limit of your ministry with a certain individual is just encouraging them along that line. When you take the word joy, Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is something that you and I are supposed to help spread abroad. So if the Holy Spirit is controlling you, should you always walk around like you got a, well, you were baptized in lemon juice? Shouldn't we occasionally look happy? I mean, once in a while? We shouldn't always be down in the dump, should we? We should be able to be happy about something. But you see, God wants to shed abroad the fruit of the Spirit through us because it says so in the book of Romans in chapter 5 and verse 5. Now, the word peace, peace. Do you know that everybody has a sinful nature, right? You know anybody that got one? 
Hey, everybody got one? Isn't it easy for that old sinful nature we have to get riled up? Is it possible? It sure, it don't take much men just like that. But we should strive to try to bring peace as much as, the Bible talks about it in the book of Matthew chapter 5, then peacemakers. It means you make peace. Now, sometimes I've caused war. <laughs> sometimes my preaching does that too a little bit. But now, regards what it is, long-suffering. Now, why does the Holy Spirit need long-suffering? Well, he doesn't need it. Holy Spirit don't need any of these things. But there's people that need all of these things, but they don't know about all these things. So they'll learn them from us. We're supposed to demonstrate long-suffering. Now, what is long-suffering? It means you can suffer a long time before you explode. It's the difference between short-fused and long-fused. Short fuse, you can light it and you better run quick. Or you have a long fuse, count to a hundred. And so the Holy Spirit can give you long suffering. And what we call sometimes patience. Remember that God is the God of patience. Well, when he gave us the Holy Spirit, he gave us the Holy Spirit with the characteristics of God the Father. That's where this comes from. And so now we're supposed to be his children manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. It's so much easier, I think, for the flesh to manifest itself than the fruit of the Spirit to manifest itself. You ever strive between the two? You ever have a problem with it? When you says here, gentleness, the Holy Spirit don't have to worry about being gentle, but He does it through us. Because these are things that helps a person to step back away from the flesh because you can encourage people to walk in the flesh or encourage them to come back from that. Meekness. Meekness is strength under control. Like having a great big old stallion and a little girl sitting on his back guiding that horse over the hill. That's strength under control. Moses was a meek man. Doesn't mean he was a weak man. But strength under control. And you and I are supposed to have our under control by the Holy Spirit. So we have to learn how to do this. And temperance, self-control, all these things, these are good things, and they're to help us to reach our goal. Because if we walk in the flesh, we, we discourage ourselves, others, and do us some damage. So for the sake of the gospel, the sake of the lost soul, and for the sake of Christ, Let's try to go forth and bring forth fruit. And don't let the devil get the best of us in any way, shape, or form. Now, we've got some things coming up soon. And uh, I couldn't believe it today. For 10 years, 10 long years, I have been working and developing newsletters. I have sent out close to 100 newsletters since I've been here. Has any of y'all ever gotten any of my newsletters? And I have taken a lot of time getting those newsletters done. Today I walked into the office, the bookstore office, and there was Kyla. And I says, what are you doing? She says, I'm doing a flyer. And I looked at it and I says, that needs to have this and this. She corrected it. It turned out beautiful. I thought, how'd she know how to do that? I didn't teach her. I know, if I don't teach them, they ought not know how to do it, right? I said, you get that done, you email it to me. She emailed it to me with the information that I've been trying to do on newsletters. And it wasn't about two clicks. I put it into my little program that I've got where I sent it out to and, and I've been spending hours getting it done, and it was done with one click. I was furious, happy in the Lord, and frustrated that I've spent so many hours struggling with this thing. I even had Jesse and Bob come in there yesterday or today. That was the day. Oh. 
And I thought, how did this, this girl that, she don't know nothing. She just, just comes in the office and she sits there and she does all this. Now she's got the job. Her, her, her resume is expanding. So I, I can't wait to find out what else she knows. But listen, I have been patient for all these years. Spent hours. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Because I didn't know there was another way. Sometimes if, if, if you, you can learn something, you can even learn something from a woman. And this is, it, it blows your mind. You know, because a lot of times we know, the, we know as men, we're smart. But the women, who said that? Did you say that? You're going to die a slow death over a big old Georgia ant pile. They ain't red ants. But God is good. And we can learn from each other. You'd be surprised. I was told this. Learn from everybody because every man is your master in something. Now I have to put in there the women too. So I'm thankful. Thank you so much, Kyla. She outdid herself. And as soon as I said how great a job, the first thing she says, give me a raise. Y'all pray for Kyla. She's looking for a job. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> Look up here. And if you're watching by internet, so simple. This hand represent you and me. The wall represents sin. We all have sin on us. God loves us, but he hates our sin. And for us to pay for sin is eternal separation from God in hell. But God loves us and wants us to go to heaven. And because he wants us to go to heaven, well, he had to do something for it because we could not earn eternal life. This hand represents Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. He came to the world because he loves us, hates our sin, took the sin, paid for it on the cross, came back from the dead. And God said if we'll believe he did it for us, he'd put that payment to our account. We go to heaven on what Christ did for us. And when you trust Christ as your Savior, the Lord says the Holy Spirit indwells us. And the Holy Spirit wants to live through us. So God knows people need love. And they need patience. And they need strength. They need encouragement. They need all the fruits of the Spirit. And you have all of those characteristics now in your new birth through the Holy Spirit. And God wants to manifest that. Shed it abroad. He uses us. And you want God to use you. To me, that's the easiest way I know how to explain some of these things. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we are thankful. You've been good to us. We thank you for meeting our needs, giving us the free gift of eternal life, and then challenging us with your word to serve you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, no one looking around. And if you're watching by internet, right where you are, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, why not trust him right now? If you'll trust him, he'll give you eternal life. Eternal life means it lasts forever. He'll never cast you out and never lose you. But after you trust Christ as Savior, maybe you already know the Lord. God wants you to serve Him. The Holy Spirit lives within you, and He wants to use you. He wants to manifest the characteristics of God the Father through His child. And if you trust the Lord, you're His child. Father, we thank you again for your blessings. Thank you for this time together. Bless each one here. In Christ's name we pray.